Pushkin. Johnny Marr is maybe the last in a line of acclaimed British guitarists. He's played with tons of bands, including most famously the Smiths. Marr started playing guitar as a young teenager growing up in Manchester. When he turned 15, he dropped out of school and moved to London to join the band Sister Ray. A couple of years later, he wound up helping to form the Smiths with Morrissey, Mike Joyce, and Marr's friend and bassist Andy Rourke. Then, after the Smiths broke up in 87, he went on to collaborate with an array of different musicians and play in bands like The Pretenders, The The, and even later, Modest Mouse. In the early aughts, Mars started releasing solo material, and he's on the brink of releasing a new album full of the best songs from his solo career. On today's episode, I talked to Johnny Marr about his exciting work in the studio with Pharrell and Hans Zimmer. Marr also recalls the terror he felt performing live in front of massive stadiums full of fans with the pretenders on U2's Joshua Tree Tour. He also talks about the time he bought a Fender Stratocaster with Noel Gallagher from Oasis. That Strat had nine pickups and eventually led him to write one of the best songs of his solo career. This is Broken Record, liner notes for the digital age. I'm Justin Richmond. Just a quick note here. You can listen to all of the music mentioned in this episode on our playlist, which you can find a link to in the show notes. For licensing reasons, each time a song is referenced in this episode, you'll hear this sound effect. Here's my conversation with Johnny Marr. It seems like a really sort of whirlwind time in your life it must be like a lot of things that are connected to you no do you know what i've been really lucky that in hand on heart and maybe except uh for i don't know a period in my i guess mid 30s or something where you know for a couple of years i was sort of like um doing other things but i i feel like i've been busy for like 40 years or something i mean the I know it sounds crazy, but I'm always, I'm kind of busy because I'm a workaholic. Well, actually, it's a bad way of putting it. I'm really passionate about what I do. I've been doing the same things as intensely as I do now. I've been doing that since I was 15. I left school at 15 yeah. uh, to join a pro band with adults at 15. And then really ever since 1982, where when I first made my first record with the Smiths, I just feel like I've never really stopped, you know. So I've been, obviously, I feel very very grateful to be to do that but yeah i mean i suppose the last the last big thing i did was the bond movie with Hans zimmer but and this year really we've got a best of coming out i was on tour with the killers last year and right now i'm just rehearsing to go out and do some more stuff really you know i've not done a solo best of yet uh before that's about to come out now and that was uh that was to do with the record company and the management just kind of went hey look we know that you're going to be expecting to go in and make another LP, make another album. Well, you only just done a double album last year, so just hold your horses and let's just, it's been 10 years since you've had this solo band and let's just put it all on a best of. And if you if you think it's a good listen, let's do it. Do you like it? Have you have you sequenced it and listened? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I know this might sound a little odd to say, but um, being given the assignment to to put a, a best of out when it wasn't driven by me, when it come from someone else, I'm going, oh, okay, right, all right, let me look at that. And then getting it all mastered and, and listening to it, you know, because I had to listen to the test pressings, right? So the test pressings come in. And uh, so, I, you know, I've been doing this since I was a kid, right? Test pressings come, I'm always excited about that. Like, oh, great, white labels. And you put it on the turntable and you have to sit and you have to listen for any little pops or anything. You know, I said to the band, guys, last night I got the test pressings of the... Do you know, it's a pretty good album, man. It's a good listen. You know, because I don't take anything for granted, you know, Justin. So, yeah, so I'm pleased yeah. with it. It's great. I'm, I'm, I'd be excited to check that out because i sort of been, over the last year, just curating, oddly enough, just different playlists of things that you're involved in. Like, right. I don't know, just randomly resequencing Smith's records just for fun. Or, like, yeah. I made a playlist of stuff that was just stuff that you've played on but weren't like bands that you were actually a part of yeah and and then your last record the fever dreams one through four i mean just came out it was like a, a wealth of <laughs> great material you know thanks i'm glad that that i've done all of that stuff i mean obviously but i did a couple of tracks with beck and then i did 
maybe four or five tracks with John Fashanti and then I popped up on records with all these different really cool musicians. Bert and, Janch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Bert Janch, yeah. And that was, uh, so, well, as I was doing it, I was thinking, wow, man, this is, oh, I love this music and what a cool thing, you know. Um, so say like when John Fashanti he invited me over to when he was working on the Imperium and it was like, I've got these tracks, take your pick. And he played me a track. I was like, oh, I think I can do something on that. Bang. And played me another track. Oh, I've got an idea for that. Bang. And then, you know, a couple of days later, you kind of go, well, that was a nice experience. So I feel what I'm saying is it, none of it's planned. It's all this kind of, I'm going to say it, a journey uh, of, be, of being a musician and being very, very fortunate that people who are doing cool things have, have invited me to to do cool things with them, you know. It's never been planned. <laughs> Is it something about you, like you yourself as a person, or about your playing, or a bit of both, that allows you to fit in with so many different kinds of people? Well, I guess so, but I, I think musicians are very uh, welcoming and inclusive types of people it might be a bit cheesy but I have a certain kind of pride in that not my personal coming about myself but my you know brothers and sisters of music you know they because let's put it this way I've been around I don't know whether you've ever been in a room with several actors or in a taxi with several comedians but often there's a bit of a competitive vibe with I know it's a generalization right I've, I know a bunch of great actors and I know a bunch of some great comedians, right? But I've noticed that musicians are very... You get a couple of musicians together and they go, hey, did you have you ever heard this thing that came out in 1986? Oh, man, you're going to love it. Oh, I really, really like this thing. Or, oh, man, did you know that he played the drums on this record in 1965? And you, and there's always this sharing kind of thing. Well, I'm really typical like that as a, as a musician, I suppose. I'm very enthusiastic if I hear something that, that I'm into... And the people that I've mentioned, maybe Pep, Pep Shop Boys as well, you know, we had a little bit of a tradition for a while there where they would always get me to do the B-sides of their singles. They were like, well, okay, we've got these this electro pop and the B-side, usually it'd be like this. The B-side is slightly experimental and it'd be interesting to put a guitar on it, which in Pet Shop Boys land is being experimental. Which And, then, and they go, okay, well, Johnny will do it. And um, <laughs> I, I, and I'm the guy for that because I love them, and that's so how I've got to be on more Pet Shop Boys records than any other musician. I pop up and do all the ones where they go, "Hey, listen, we've got this guitar song," you know. I'm very proud of that. So to answer your question, it's partly to do with my personality being very a very typical kind of musician. That means I will stay in the studio either listening to stories or telling stories till really till three a.m. or whatever. It used to be seven a.m., but these days a little bit more moderate. Uh, and the other thing is, I guess the second thing you mentioned that I, I like to play guitar that I think is appropriate to the to whatever the song is. Yeah. So if all that's required is, you know, like recently on Noel Gallagher stuff, for instance, I'm not going in there going right. Okay, I, by bar eight, you really need to know that I'm on it. I just kind of go, what's the song? And I sort of think yeah. in that regard, I. I'm not really beyond thinking like a session musician. I don't have to really be this big deal on it. You know what I mean? It's the thing I, I really enjoy about your playing and your career is there is this bit of you that almost approaches music the way like a jazz musician did in the 50s oh, yeah. or 60s. Like Herbie Hancock could put out, you know, Imperial Islands, but then also just go play on like a great Lee Morgan record. And, and he puts as much of his heart and soul into that side man work, quote unquote, you can tell as he seemed to have done his own records, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's an absolute honour because I think that sort of feel, feels about right. I think when you were talking then, I was thinking paradoxically, people who say they don't like jazz or people who don't like jazz think it's about just people blowing. But to me, one of the best things about jazz musicians is to be a good jazz musician, you have to listen. Yeah. You have to listen to what everybody else is doing. It's a conversation. And you know, you can do that in indie rock. Again, I come back to, say, the most recent thing uh, that I've done with somebody else, with no Gallagher stuff. I want to make the record really good, you know? So yeah. there's bits where you lay out and then there's bits when you play just textural stuff 
and then there's bits where you come in with the riff and and ultimately it's his record and his vision and he trusts me to do because he knows that I'm all about the big picture I'm not about me just stepping all over it other times though you know uh, I did a record with uh, the Australian project Avalanches a, a few years ago with it, me and MGMT I forgot you were on there yeah me and MGMT did a, a, a song with them and that was that was really cool because they had this idea for this riff and I said oh, okay well what about if I just develop it and then what I did was sort of featured and that kind of floated through the track so it's it's whatever's appropriate, really. I remember um, when I was learning, maybe 12, 13, something, so it would have been in the mid-70s, just before punk broke out. Back then, there wasn't, you know, you wouldn't be able to go in Barnes & Noble or Waterstones in England and see, like, shelves and shelves of books about anybody. You know, I'm sure yeah. Justin Bieber has got a whole a whole wall full, <laughs> but whatever. Yeah. 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 But back then, that wasn't a thing, right? So I would read the music press and I would go into the library and if a book did appear about whoever it was, it, I didn't, if it caught my interest, I would read it or I'd just stand in the bookstore and read it. There's only a few things around. I remember there's one about Pete Townsend and there was a Miles Davis one and there was Led Zeppelin ones and stuff. But anyway, when you start off, if you're really obsessive as I was, it, some bits of information really stick to you. And um, there was... It was either Keith Richards or John Lennon, I think, was saying that the, the most important part of being a guitar player is being able to play rhythm. Mm, and yeah. to a 12 year old boy whose pals are all going, you know, trying to play all this shreddy stuff or whatever, when I read that information, I was kind of like, huh, it sounded really noble to me. And this yeah. thing of underpinning the band and having the groove down and all of that. And then obviously, as time went on and I got into people like Keith Richards or, or obviously now Rogers, people like that. And, you know, Jimmy Nolan, who plays with James Brown and uh, just any number of really great rhythm players. That's just one of the chapters that you need to have got through. You know what I mean? It's, all, it's just part yeah. of being a guitar player, I think. I just think it's really cool to just like be appropriate to the song. Yeah. Is your phone just open? You just say people just know you're, you're ready to play always or... Pretty, yeah, no, pretty much because it's been that way uh, for years. I mean, a lot. I know a lot of people. I mean, I'm always, I'm never not available for Brian Ferry because I've been working with Brian now since 1987. Uh, and Brian's always writing and he's always he's always making tracks. He's always got tracks up on the go and he comes back to them and all of this sort of stuff. So that's been an ongoing thing for years. But then oh, since, I guess, 2010, Hans Zimmer, if if Hans wants something doing, even if it's something on the on the quiet, just, you know, he needs a little bit of this, or I'll do that. What an incredible relationship yeah. to have. I mean, musical relationship you guys have built. Yeah, he really taught me a lot. I think with Hans, he's he's um, he, he's got the soul of a rock musician, and if you go to his his shows, which are now like three hours long, and then some of the pieces that he's doing in this current show, which actually my son plays plays in it, I've been up I've been upgraded to the Ma version two two point <laughs> zero. Uh, so my son plays in that, but there are some moments in that show that are. It makes Kashmir sound like a boy band. It's wow. amazingly orchestrated rock music. At the heart of it is rock music. And, you know, with me and Hans, you know, once we get talking about music and talking about Mellotrons and Fairlights or late 60s Strats or what, you know, or, or um, Tangerine Dream or whatever, next thing we look at our watch and it's, you know, it's, quarter past three in the a.m., you know, and like, oh, we've got yeah. to, we just sit around in studios listening to music, playing music or talking about music. It, it's So that's what my pals are like. My friends are the same as me, you know. We're, yeah. It's it's what I dreamed of when I was a kid, you know. Fushante, same kind of character. Being around John Fushante, the amount of guitar players he can reference in a given moment 
and he feels like he's able to synthesize <laughs> all of these disparate, you know, yeah. it's, he's like almost like a computer to me. Like talk about AI. It's like, how is he pulling from all of that at once? That's, it's, it's insane. Well, it's a, well, there's a couple of things that come to mind when you say that. Um, I think you're absolutely right about John and there's a few other people I know like that. I think people who are great, whoever they are, but in my, my field, it's mu musicians. They are experts, absolute experts. And that might sound obvious, but there's this famous story about when Bob Marley first went into um, into record and it was like some little four track and he was like 16 or 17 or something. I think it was with Coxone or something. And um, if you hear enough about those stories, you, you hear, you know, he was kind of a pain in the ass because he would be like, the backing vocals are too loud. The backing vocals are too loud because he'd studied the coasters and he'd studied the drifters and he'd studied... Curtis Mayfield in the impressions. So he knew how the backing vocals on those, this was when he was a kid, right? Insane. But you could go right across in sports, but I'm sure in business too, but right. people who are great are real experts. I guess it's not a surprise because it's your passion. So you become you know, obsessive. To, you become obsessive. Yeah. Because you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. you love it. That's right. You know, and then the second thing you're talking about there, like with John is, and, and other people like that are, there's a lot of musicians like this, they take all of these different elements that only to them make sense. And then yeah. it comes out, but when you hear it, it goes, oh yeah, it sounds like them. So for example, in my case, like for 40 years, I didn't really do a lot of interviews in the early Smith days, but when I was asked about guitar playing, when I had to really nail it down, I was like, well, Nile Rogers, Bert Janch, and James Williamson from the studios. Now, wow. that's, yeah, but that's a pretty, like, but after anyone who's followed me for years and years knows that they're my, like, they're my treat. I mean, obviously, I, I love a lot, you know, I love what Roy Gallagher was doing. I love what, you know, John McGeoch from the Banshees and Will Sargent from the Bunnymen. I mean, there's hundreds. I mean, I could stay here just giving lists and lists of amazing guitar players, obviously. But at first, people would, were like, huh? Come again? What, you like, now Rogers, that influencer Smiths. But over time now, people know that some of these songs like the I go well listen to the boy with, listen to the second verse in the boy with the thorn in his side and or I, there's a famous you know story about when I wrote Hand in Glove it just started out as a chic riff so point being that that right. made total sense to me but you put it all through a funnel your comes in through your own mind and then it comes out and people go oh yeah that sounds like Johnny Marr right but to me if I told you what I was thinking of when I was trying to come up with some of these riffs you'd go what? <laughs> I'm so glad to hear you mentioned James Williamson too, though, because as much as I love um, the Ash, you know, Brown Ashton and, and, and the Ashton brothers, James Williamson, man, like some of those, I feel like some of that music with James gets discounted. Like Kill City, um, oh, the record he yeah. did with Iggy is just one. I mean, I don't know, man. I go to that record all the time because it just it, it just blows me away. Well, that's amazing because when when I first met. Noel Gallagher, he, he was a fairly, he was young. Noel would have been about maybe 20 or something, 19. I was pretty young myself, uh, maybe 26, 27. But the first time he came to my house, that was the record I gave him. He wasn't aware of it. But I don't know whether this is. So what I got from um, James Williamson, I, I had a riff that I was playing when I was about 15. Uh, and it was something like... And a friend of mine, Billy Duffy, went on it being the call. He said to me, oh, that sounds like Gimme Danger. And I was like... What is that? I've never heard of Gimme Danger. And anyway, so a uh, uh, well, long story, but I, I, I tracked down Raw Power. And it's a so when I heard that, I went, well, that sounds like the way I'm trying to play. Yeah. So, you know, uh, the truth be told, I was a bit pissed that someone had already beat me to this this new song I was writing. So J James is, is a massive influence on me. Massive. When I heard that, I just kind of went, you're on the right path. You know, you, you're doing the right thing. And then with, say, uh, just for an illustration, seeing as I don't always do this, but seeing as a, a guitar, I don't think we can hear this properly. But uh, the Smith song, Hand in Glove, well, that started off, when I first started playing it, it, uh, it went, which is me trying to be chic. I and it was it. My, my girlfriend said, make it sound more like Iggy, so I did, and it ended up sounding like that. But that, And that was the first Smith single, but when we came out, no one believe when I said I was now Rogers was a huge influence on me you know so you know that's what musicians are like though aren't they and, and I think maybe creative people as well sometimes you're trying to copy your heroes and and your limitations kind of 
get, I mean, I'm not the first person to say this, but your limitations just kind of put a stamp on what you can and can't do. We're going to take a break and then come back with more of my interview with Johnny Marr. We're back with more from Johnny Marr. How much in terms of just raw skill do you feel like you've developed from, let's say, 1980 to now? Well, I took it really seriously. I started, my parents, to this day, still really, they're music freaks. So I grew up in a house of Irish parents who who know, treated music like it was a religion. So if they like someone, they really, really, really like them. And um, so I went to see my parents, they were in their 80s now, and my, my dad was showing me this country music podcast that he just got into. And they're still doing it to this day. My mother, she's super into, like, watching new country singers and song, singer-songwriters on um, on YouTube. Wow. So they were really young when I was a kid, so I was brought up around all these young Irish adults, uh, you know, teenagers really playing music. So to answer your question, what happened was I just got really obsessed with a guitar. I got my first proper one that I could play chords on when I was about eight or nine. And then I started just trying to play the records on the radio like a lot of people. So I started playing, yeah, like, getting my own little tunes together and stuff when I was about nine or ten and then enrolling my friends to be in these little bands and I was, you know, I'd write, I'd do just like T-Rex rip-offs really. All my songs were yeah. just like T-Rex copies. And then um, I, I just had a sort of natural knack to be at a place to certain kind of riffs. But if I'd have been the sort of person who was, um, you know, just in a copying other people and not being a songwriter, uh, you know, I probably would have, been shredding away forever but you know but it's not really my thing that really I wanted to sort of um I wanted to have my own band with my own sound you know so the the skill I've amassed I don't know if this is answering your question but come back to Hans Zimmer what I did on Inception was pretty simple but when it came to actually playing it on stage with an orchestra like 60 pieces on stage with a choir and all of that stuff I wouldn't have ever been able to do that when I was in my 20s. I wouldn't have been able to do it in my 30s either, really. And I might not have even come up with that really simple part. I think when you get older, you kind of know what you're about. And um, it's about... Um, that. What I came up with was kind of right for the movie. And um, I might not have ever been able to do that when I was young. But I practice every day. I go through periods where I just practice, practice. And then I play absentmindedly when I'm, you know around the house and watching TV. But I'm, I'm going through another phase now where I'll come in this little studio here and put the headphones on and and just play and play and try and get, you know, try and get my chops up. Maybe that's because I'm going out live or I don't know why. But that connects me to the kid I was when I was 11 or 12. It's, honestly, it's got nothing to do with career. It's got yeah. nothing to do with the Smiths, got nothing to do with like, you know, Johnny Marr or nothing to do with business or anything. It's because that was my first love when I was 10 or 11. I used to peel off from when kids were playing football or we were whatever, we were climbing trees or whatever. Sometimes I would just go and disappear and I'd go into my room on my own and, and just play for a couple of hours, not even plugged in and I'd make all these discoveries and um, yeah. moving chord shapes around. And, and you know what, man? I'm so grateful that I still want to do that. Yeah. For fun. It's, yeah. it's like, it's my hobby. Yeah. It's the dream for any guitar player to have a setup just like you have and to be able to do that all day. That's... Yeah. I mean, yeah, for, yeah, for yeah, any yeah, musician, yeah. you know, whatever your respective instrument is, like, that's the dream. Yeah. But then when it comes time to do an album, sometimes I have to... I know myself well enough that I have to um, think about the guitar in a different way. Hey, man, listen, if you give me an if you give me three more lifetimes, okay, I, I'd love to be John McLaughlin. Yeah. Oh. But I'm also yeah, quite man. happy, and but I'm also really happy having been the guitar player in Modest Mouse for a few years. That's fine by me. That was incredible work, man. Incredible Thank work you, on the yeah. Modest Mouse record. That was because I was in a situation with amazing chemistry. There was a moment when um, we were in Mississippi and we were recording the record, and it was one of those times, right, it was like maybe, whatever, four o'clock in the afternoon, we'd been trying to get the, the backing track down to uh, some song uh, on week three or whatever, and I was just stood there, and then I just had a moment of 
present moment awareness, as you know, as it's called, where I just looked around and I went, the chemistry in this room with these bunch of people is really, really special. This particular bunch of people right now is not just a good vibe, but it's really unusual. Because one, yeah. we had two drummers in that band. One drummer was, his his thing was like, he might have been like, okay, on this track, I hear Pear Ubu, or I hear uh, Public Image, Public Image, yeah. or I hear Stuart Copeland. He, so Joe Plummer would be doing that. And then Jeremiah Green, who passed away just only a few months ago, he was the other drummer, and he would have been going in his head, oh, this is like um, Fella Cootie, or this is like a rave, or... So you had those two drummers like that, and then... The bass player, Eric Judy, he was always writing these like little tunes on either accordion at that time or he was teaching himself, yeah, he was teaching himself the accordion, he was teaching himself the flute. And he had some little riff that he'd be playing on the flute. And then he'd just go, oh, I'll just try and do that on the bass. So he had these really unusual, cool, almost dubby bass lines. And then the other guy in the band, he's a real utility guy and he might have been doing something on a pedal steel or his mind was somewhere else. And then Isaac's got his amazing multi-layered lyrical agenda that, you know, is coming from all different places. And then I got my thing that I was like, when I get out of bed that day or that week, I was going, this is what I want my, this is what I want to bring to this outfit, whatever agenda I've got. And it all fit, it all just fitted together. Did you did you have to think through how you might blend with this? Because it seems like everyone felt like they had their thing and you're kind of getting put into it. Yeah. Did it take you a second to figure out, okay, this is what I want to bring? Or was yeah. it kind of just luckily instantaneous? No, no. I conceptualized it, which I don't mean for that to sound very dry or contrived, even though... Uh, no, I really enjoyed going, what's my role here? How can I be yeah. really useful and bring something uh, melodic, catchy technical it was a little like ocean six and i happened to be the kind of british bomb disposal expert or the <laughs> safe cracker yeah. i was like the yeah, safe yeah, cracker. yeah yeah uh, no i really enjoyed that i thought okay i can't just put my head down and go one two three four and just play i, I really really enjoyed devising all these parts and on that record we were dead for anyone who's interested usually I'm doing all the stuff on the left and Isaac's doing the stuff on the right. And we, um, this might be getting a bit too muso, but when we were coming up with all those songs and those parts, we were in this attic in Portland. And sometimes Isaac and I, the way I started to think about it, it was like, you know, two racing car drivers that were on the same team, you know, like sometimes like McLaren and stuff, you same team. And we're both going around this track. And then sometimes it's like, no, after you, no, after you, after you. And occasionally we literally physically crashed into each other because we were stood either back to back or next to each other in this kind of little space and it was really hot and we're up there and we've been up there for hours and sometimes we'd, we'd be a bit buzzed and I'm really we really listen to each other and I'm trying to then I'll just jump up the octave and then I, he'd play something and I'd go I'll get down there and and literally we sometimes would bang into each other and I thought that was really cool wow had you had that level of chemistry before like that level of intense in a different way yeah in the the but it was a different thing with all the bands that i've actually been a band member of i, I think i bring a, a certain kind of intensity and a, a sort of belief in that even even without my guitar and i think i, I bring a sort of belief in the mission because i think that's very useful in a band i mean i'm all yeah. in I think people realise that now. It used to frustrate me when I was younger, but when the press used to report it, because, uh, you know, when I was younger, I used to be a little like, oh, it looks like I'm just bailing, I'm leaving this band and I'm leaving that band. But after all these years now, I think people realise that it's anyone who's interested, it's probably the reverse, you know. Like, when I... If I join a band, I'm really in. I mean, my family... I mean, my family moved to Portland, or... It, when I was in the cribs, you know, I got in the van and I... Yeah, I played all the shows and, you know, I, I don't I don't expect any other kind of separate treatment. I really get get in because of, it's the way I was when I was 15 in bands. It's no different. That is so cool. Was it because of that level of chemistry that you realized, 
well, I'm part of the band, or was it already sort of decided you're sort of in for the ride at this point? No, do you know what? The very first night we got together, Isaac and I wrote that the song that with that single dashboard became the single. Mm. And then I woke up really jet lagged at about whatever, four o'clock in the morning, because I'd only got in from England the day before. And I woke up and I kind of was, was like, where am I? Oh, I'm in a hotel in Portland. Did we just write like a really cool, cool song with this guy? We're, in fact, we wrote two two songs that night. We wrote another one called uh, We've Got Everything. That was me and him. Wow. And then, frankly, because Muddy Smouse had paid for this English guitar player to come over for 10 days, they had to kind of get to rehearsal for noon because, uh, they, you know, they paid for my flight. And, uh, and it was kind of like a little bit like, all right, everybody, you know, you know, the ringer's here or whatever. We better get we better get here, right? But quite cleverly, Isaac had done it so a couple of members would join each day, would come, uh, me and him would feel each other out. So as the days went on, with each couple of people that arrived and we would jam and get a new song and jam and get a new song, very quickly I, I was just like, I like these guys, they like me. There's such a positive feeling, everyone's so enthusiastic something's really happening here and I phoned my manager and I said listen I'm supposed to be flying back on Wednesday or whatever I'm going to stay I'm going to stay for a few weeks and I fell in love with Portland the city uh, this was 2005 so to answer your question um, by the time you get that sort of brotherhood going in a band and you're all really excited and also you, you're playing together these long hours you know six seven hours and you've got a song and then you want to fix it the next day and then you and you're working on this thing it was that simple it just would have been really weird to bail. Yeah, 10 days and out after building that. Yeah, and then t that turned into two weeks and then three weeks and then we're all talking excitedly about, oh, man, are you going to, wouldn't it be great if you did some gigs? And I was like, wow. And and the key thing is I, I really start to, uh, I've done this with a few projects, I start to really care about the songs we're making. Yeah, I really, yeah. really care about them. Even if I haven't written, like in the, the, you know, my relationship with Matt Johnson, I really believed in what he was doing. And some songs, you know, we'd, we'd make these backing tracks and, and he'd be like, you know, soul searching about the lyrics and this isn't right and that isn't right. And I felt like I was going through all of that with him. You know, and we did this album yeah. Dusk in, in 92. But that's what I mean about being all in. You know, people don't really know that about, about me. You know, I'm 24 seven if I'm in a band. How does that translate to when you're when you're leading your own group? It's very different with my own band because it, it's a different scenario with my band. They're, they're there. We, we've had a, we've been together now ten years. The same lineup. We all live in the same postcode, pretty much. But we, we all hey look, we all live within ten miles of each other, which is kind of unusual for guys of our age. I've been in yeah. bands where people live in different cities and different countries. That was a very deliberate thing. When I came back from Portland, I moved to Manchester, not because it's my hometown. I moved here because it's a really great place to run a group. And I knew these musicians and I wanted I wanted for us to all, I wanted to be at a call a rehearsal for tomorrow night and we all be able to get there. Someone doesn't have to get on a train or a plane, right? So, but why it's different in my band is I write songs and then I bring them to the band and they, they learn them and we learn them up. And um, I kind of run it, and that's the way they like it. You know, I mean, we're really very much a group. But all the torturous, <laughs> I guess, the torturous process where the singer, which is me in this case, is soul-searching about lyrics and all that, my guys just lead me to it, and they say, look, give me a call when you've got the thing done, man. <laughs> the bastards. So <laughs> in a way, I suppose, in my experience, my band when we first got together the closest that i'd seen it's a bit uh, it's like i was saw beck beck's band we kind of when we started we kind of went that's kind of the yardstick for the kind of music like a british version of that really oh cool you know what i mean like when you you just go and see beck it was like really tight and the tempos were usually the tempos were up and the yeah. drummer's drums were really snappy and it, he was a leader but they were also a band you know but yep. You knew the guy was going to have a good band. I kind of decided with my band that that's the way I wanted us to be, really, a bit like Beck's band. Well, what makes Manchester a great place to sort of run a band out of? Well, what Seattle was to L.A. in the 90s, Manchester is that to London. 
you know what I mean? So okay. where being a musician's a little easier in Manchester's now like is well, but it's like Seattle is it's very uh, there's a lot of money in it. It's a second city, so so London. If you're a musician, okay, and you've got to get rehearsal, it takes you twice the length of time to get to rehearsal space as it does in Manchester. People are usually, I might love London and there all the time, but musicians have to live quite a long way out of town because it's really expensive to have apartments there and all of this yeah. sort of stuff. Manchester's a little bit more, is a little more like Seattle. And, you know, like Seattle, it had a big movement. It rains a lot, like Seattle. Uh, so it's an indoor culture. There's a whole load of things, you know, just to make Man uh, historically make Manchester really great to run. To run back. Well, there's a there's a history here as well. So uh, for me, in my generation, I grew up knowing like, well, the Buscocks did it. Okay, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, Buscocks. I mean, they were just like gods to my generation. Buscocks proved that you didn't have to live in the capital, that you could live in the provinces and make great, really cool music. Because before that, it was just it was all about London, 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 all these bands. It was either London and LA, really, London, LA. So you've got a heritage and then... So because Buscox did it, Smiths were able to do it, and The Fall, and then because A New Order and Joy Division, and because The Smiths and Joy Division and New Order did it, then Happy Mondays and Stone Roses knew they could do it, and then because they could saw that, you know, they did it, then Oasis saw that they could do it, and so on. Yeah. Youngsters know that you can be a Manchester band, you know? And so that yeah. goes back, that goes right back to the 70s now with Buzzcocks. So having that in the air and knowing that it's a musical town is a good place to sort of grow up around when you're a fledgling musician. But really, it goes way back historically to like the 1860s, 1870s, when Manchester was literally the industrial capital of the world and the Industrial Revolution and it, all the immigrants came so from really everywhere, Eastern Europe and the Caribbean, the West Indies and Ireland in my case and all of this business. So there's a, it's a real melting pot Manchester of working class immigrants and they all brought their own cultures and their own need for entertainment. So a lot of comedians, yeah. Jewish comedians came out of here. A lot of people came from Eastern Europe. In my case, you know, a lot of my family, they moved over in the early 60s and they came over to work in construction and building the roads and all of this stuff, the Irish. And um, my parents went to all the Irish clubs and they would see all the show bands. And me and my sister would go sometimes to these places in the afternoon where my dad was a booker for these bands. And so we grew up around... Your dad booked bands? Yeah, he did, yeah. Incredible. <laughs> I love yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. That was in the 70s. Me and my sister would be there. We'd be giving, like, soda and... Um, just loads and loads of sugar and I'd sit there and I'd watch these cabaret singers and they'd be their vocal their microphones would be going into a space echo or a, a tape echo or Watkins copycat and there'd be an organ player and a drummer and if I was lucky there'd be a guitar player and they'd be playing all these kind of 70s songs and I thought that was amazing I just watched these me and my sister would watch these bands be like holy shit, this is great. And sometimes I'd go, no, nah, they're not too good, Dad. No, nah, they're not too good. But just seeing the amplifiers and the electric guitars and all that, I would have been like nine or ten. I thought that was magic, yeah. Wow. So your dad did construction and then somehow got into booking band. Like, what was that? <laughs> well, that was to do with the that Catholic... Happen? That was to do with the Catholic Church because he was... No, he's, so he's a working-class Irish guy, as I say, and he... He laid pipes. He dug holes in the road. My dad, I'm very proud of it. Wow. But to do with the, the Catholic Church, big Irish thing, they would have bands on uh, on a Friday, <laughs> a Friday and a Saturday night, and all these bands would go and audition in these bars or these pubs, usually on a Sunday afternoon. And all of these, they used to call themselves agents, but all these people who, who could say, "Hey, listen, come and play at my social club for fifty pounds." So they would go and audition for people like my dad, you know. So amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they weren't all that great, but to me, it was magic. It must have been an education unto itself, you know, in terms of how to be and on stage and, you know, 100%, how not it, to be. A hundred percent. What it was, was the big thing for me was that I, um, when I watched these bands set up their equipment, when I was about seven or eight, at these parties, so this this was a little early because we used to have these these bands play at christening. It being I don't know, reinforce a cultural stereotype, but there was a lot of christenings and a lot of weddings, and um, 
my aunties and uncles had, used to have these bands come and play. But when I saw these adults setting up their equipment, that was when it occurred to me that, oh, this is a job. Ah, usually nearly always guys. These guys, and I see the same people, these same guys, and they'd be bringing their amplifiers and someone setting the drum kit. I'd be like, oh, as an adult, you can do that. It's not just people on the television. Because on the television, I just see these bands magically appear. Magic. And all, it's and, magic. And, and looking great, you know, with the velvet <laughs> yeah. suits on and all of this. And I'd actually yeah. see these men setting up their equipment and, and pulling these amplifiers and feeding back and testing. And, and I, I was like, where do I sign up for that? Wow. wow. That looks like a great job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and your parents must have been thrilled as much into music as they are that you sort of think in that way, right? Yeah, you know, I think a, pro a lot of people can probably relate to this. They were absolutely thrilled until at 15, I decided, to, or 14, decided that I was going to go for it and not go to school. And ah, right, right. So now that it's worked out and I've actually, you know, it's my day job, they're really, really proud. M much more than the fact that I'm famous, they're just really proud that I'm a full-time guitar player. Seriously. And if I ever make records where there's not enough guitar in it, I kind of get to hear about it. Right. Uh, <laughs> You're slagging yeah. off. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but you know, man, craft work. No, it's okay, I'm playing, I'm playing synth on this one. So they're proud of that. But you know, like a lot of teenagers, you know, I went through kind of a pretty rebellious and rough patch. Uh, we, we went through a kind of a bit of a, uh, you know, typical sort of rebellious kind of, uh, they were worried that when I stopped going to school and was very obviously, you know, taking drugs and spending all my time with these reprobates. But it, it was all really wrapped up with the music as well. It wasn't just hedonistic stuff. I joined a band, the thing yeah. was I joined a band when I was 15 who of adults who were very dubious. And my parents kind of said, well, it's either that or you have to get out. So, so I just left home, you know, but... Just got out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that was a bit contentious. And, I, you know, so I was a little wild at uh, 15, 16, but... What was your sister thinking? My sister was the mediator. She was the great mediator. She was only 11 months younger than me. We were very tight and still are, you know. But it was a funny one because, yeah, they were proud of me being a musician, but I think when I actually was like, listen, I'm going to go for it and I'm going to go to London and I'm going to, even though, you know, I had no money whatsoever and I'm going to join this band and these adults so it were very obviously kind of dangerous characters you know they're pretty druggy they sounded like a cross between uh hawkwind and i guess the stooges they're called sister ray i think their tracks up on youtube it's this got a song called suicide so because he'd made a record they sought me out at 15 right and they were like come and be in the band and I, i'm pretty sure i said listen you are aware that i'm i am 15 or 14 even i think I didn't want it to be a freak show. And they were like, hey, listen, no, come on, come on. It'll be cool. So I used to go to their rehearsal a couple of times a week in the, and it was the red light area, really kind of rough area in Manchester a couple of nights a week. And um, to subsidise that, I used to sell clothes to my pals and work in clothes shops and all. But anyway, I left, I had to leave home. I had to leave home to do that because my parents didn't approve. And that was a little bit of a, kind of a rough, a bit of a, I look back now and it was a bit of a wild time for me, but. London in 77 at 14, 15. Yeah. That must have been, that must have been crazy. Well, it was amazing because I went to the, I went to the marquee when I was 15 to see a band called Pearl Harbor and the Explosions and they had the Stray Cats. Who else was in London at the time? The Clash was still around. So this is 78, 79. And uh, I was really into this band called The Only Ones. You know that song, Another Girl, Another Planet? Yeah. So I, I I fell in love with this band called The Only Ones and I, I followed them around quite a bit. And that involved, you know, sleeping on train stations, me and Andy Rourke, who was my best pal at the time, who was who I enlisted in the Smiths. So we, um, yeah, and I used to hang around clothes shops and that was all, to me, that was all part of uh, the apprenticeship of being a musician because I heard loads of records. As I say, I saw Brian Setzer when I was, I think, 14, I saw Patti Smith when I was 14. Uh, I saw The Cramps. And to me, all of this stuff has made me what I am, really. Seeing all those bands when I was really young. What did you think of Brian Setzer at the time? I couldn't believe it. He was amazing. And what were the Stray Cats doing over there? 
They they had a hit. They they, they had a. I think they I think they were England was where they took off. And me and my really? pals were like, listen, there's this crazy guitar player. It's a rockabilly band. I saw them. I think there was you know maybe about thirty people in the audience in this hall that held like eight hundred people. So all of that stuff, you know, I saw Perubu. And I saw a whole load of bands I didn't care for because we used to sneak into all the venues. So I look back on all of that and it, it can sound romantic and I can make it sound romantic and that's because it actually was. I had no problem with walking back from a venue from going to see some band, whether I liked them or not, walking back for miles with no tra you know train fare and it all feeling like it was part of an apprenticeship, you know? Yeah, yeah, all part of the mission. <laughs> yeah. How did you meet Andy Rourke? We went to the same school and he was, you know, it's like with guys in school. Uh, I saw a guy, another guy with long hair, long scruffy hair. And um, we were either going to be friends or we were going to fight. It, <laughs> it, 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 we were either like in competition or we were comrades. Yeah. And I think yeah. neither of us wanted to fight. You know, I, I, I had a, a button that you kept in America and a badge that said that it was a Neil Young tonight's the night. And he walked oh, up to me man. and he, he went, uh, tonight's the night. And he did this really amazing Neil Young impression. And I was just really impressed that he knew what tonight's the night was. You do that kind of thing when you're a kid. It's so important. I was like, yeah. wow. I mean, I wasn't going to wear one that had Harvest. It had to be, obviously, it had to be a really obscure badge. And, uh, and he walked up to me and he just sang tonight's the night. And I thought, wow, this guy's cool. And then we just yeah. became friends for life. You know, it's beautiful. Yeah. Did you see Neil on that Tonight's the Night tour in London? No, no, that was, I was too young for that. Yeah. You know the big amazing story about that, about Tonight's the Night, that tour. So he came over to England. He played at the Scala, which I might be wrong about. It might be the Rainbow. But anyway, uh, John Lydon told me this. So he comes and the album hadn't been released yet. And it's also a real down, heavy album, as you know, right? Anyway, he comes out and he's got a scraggly beard and he's drinking loads of tequila and the, the stage, and if you look on the inside of that record, the stage set is crazy. It's got platform boots hanging up and it's got like a, it's got hubcaps all over the stage and a fake palm tree. So, so he comes out and he starts playing this album no one's ever heard. So he plays Tonight's the Night from start to finish. It's not even been released yet and it's this real down alcohol kind of thing. And he plays it and the audience are like, what the hell is this? And it's going down kind of badly. He goes off and gets called back on for the encore. And he says to the audience, now I'm going to play one that you've heard before. And he plays Tonight's the Night again. <laughs> <laughs> that happened. I just saw Neil six nights ago. So it was just like, this guy does not give a fuck. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you know, I've never seen him play. You've never seen Neil? Never, man. It's crazy. I just for some reason or other, just never. It's worth it. It's just I've never yeah. seen someone so single-minded, so oh, right, single-minded. Okay. You know those. Don't want to generalize too much, but I've met a few sixties musicians, which obviously you know, very very fortunate. Just just a few, a handful, and they nearly to a man and woman really care about playing. You know, I mean, I might sound obvious, but the, the most important thing is you know, if there's a guitar in the room, they will pick it up. And, uh, and they'll play Ronnie Wood's like that, Donovan's like that, you know, Paul McCartney's really like that, you know, like those people, hats off to them, you know, I think they're really, uh, that's, ironically, it's kind of come around where some of those, the older generation musicians, they go out and they appear to do it because they love it, you know, whether it's your thing or not, but, you know, the Rod Stewart's and the Who's and the Jaggers and... Springsteen's and all of those sort of people, Joni Mitchell even now coming back, you know, you, it's nice to see that those people who could be just sat on their boats or sat under the palm trees or spending all the time with their architects and all of that, they appear to be out there doing it because maybe they know something that we don't, which is, you know what, there really isn't anything better. Yeah. I'm, I've realised how super fortunate I am that I have people's ears, you know, uh, there's an audience of people who are like interested in what I'm up to at the moment. That's such a motivation. It's, you know, but I do like to think that uh, this might be bullshit, but it's easy for me to say, but that if I didn't, I'd still be playing every day, practicing. Yeah. You know, just for the love of it. 
and just to yeah. try and get better, try and get better and better. In some ways, you know, if that's all you got to do all day, you get pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's horses for courses, you know. I like what bands are. I like what indie yeah. rock for for one. I don't like put myself in a box too much, but I like yeah. the area of music that I work in. I still feel like that there are surprises in that area of, of music. Obviously, you and I, we can talk about, go off on these different tangents, talk about all kinds of different music, you know? Yeah. But my mission, I felt, I think it almost kind of got doubled in a way when I got the solo band together. I felt like I had this freedom to pull in all my influences that really goes back to people like Sparks. It's an interesting thing, I think, because what you love is such a subjective thing, obviously. And I think you get to a point in your life where you kind of go back to, as an influence, you really do draw on those things that were your first loves. Yeah, I love being in the modern world. I'm not a particularly nostalgic person, but the area of music that I'm working in, guitar music, I guess, melodic, that I suppose, you know, I don't want really to use terms like art rock, but, you know, I'm, I'm fine with being called an indie musician. It all sounds like, to me, it's all what used to be called rock music anyway. For the longest yeah. time, I used to call myself a pop musician for the longest time. And still, until I started really recognising that pop music is something very, very different now. And that, I think that's post-rave and to do with the technology and all this sort of stuff. I'm not going to make past judgement on it. But when I started out at 11 or 12 and studying these records t-rex the sweet uh sparks that luckily for me had amazing guitar playing on it um on those what in england we call glam rock in america glam rock was a different thing it was a little bit to i know to do with sunset and the hair bands and all hair of that. metal yeah, yeah yeah but in england glam rock was very definitely 1972 73 74 david bowie you know you listen to the gene genie and all that stuff which you know you know those 45s were an amazing education for me. And as I say, it's probably subjective because that was when this stuff really, really hit me. But I still think that what I do is working within that area where it's, for me, the best thing is it's concise. It doesn't have to go on for seven or eight minutes unless I'm making a point. And there's guitar hooks in it and the tempos are up. And yeah. it ma it makes you, it gets the blood racing a little bit with some quite sort of interesting, clever, if possible, lyrics that fit. That's the pop musician in you. That that yeah. that's where that is located, and that's where probably I'd imagine like probably how you fell in love with Sheik in the seventies. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think with Sheik, it was to do with the the harmonic progressions a lot I always say this but with so much is made with Nile Rodgers everyone obviously th thinks even if they're not musicians what they're thinking of is his right hand yeah. well what I really fell in love with was his left hand these beautiful mm. McCoy Tyner first time I ever met Nile Rodgers first question I asked him was do you really like McCoy Tyner because the chord progressions so beautiful so pretty wow. so emotional you know, I want your love and um, lost in music and, oh, man. So that's why I like that stuff particularly. It wasn't just the groove. It was those beautiful harmonic changes. So, yeah, I'm a real melody freak. And um, I'll try and s squeeze those hooks in to exciting kind of punchy guitar music wherever I can. <laughs> Amazing. Especially if it's my own stuff. We're going to take another quick break and then come back with the rest of my conversation with Johnny Marr. We're back with the rest of my conversation with Johnny Marr. Where did the riff for uh, Spirit, Power, and Soul, can you figure out how you arrived at that riff? Yeah. What I did was months before, when I was on, on the road, we had this third album called Call the Comet. I started to think the next single off the next album should be like an electro banger. I kind of mm. did conceptualize it hand on heart. Now, hey, I wish I could do that with every track, but... The Smiths used to do that sometimes. We'd go, because I was I was given a title, often, not always, but sometimes, say, sometimes I was given a title like Panic, and I was like, oh, what does that conjure up? Or Meat is Murder. And with Meat is Murder, I set myself the task of writing a horror score for animals, because I had the title. So 
I quite enjoy, hey, listen, as I say, I wish I could do it more often, but I had the idea for Spirit, Power and Soul months before and I went, oh man, this band, the next album, the first track on it, it'd be really good if I can write an electro banger. So I started with a drum machine. I borrowed a drum machine off Steve Morris from New Order, which I've still, actually I've got to give it him back. And <laughs> um, yeah, and I thought if I'm going to borrow, if I'm going to borrow a drum machine, who better to borrow one off than Steve that's, Morris? That's great. Uh, so I got in a programming, even though I could have done it much quicker on the laptop, but that wasn't yeah. the point. I wanted to do the process, and I, I was kind of going, all right, we'll do something that's like Cabaret Voltaire. So I had the beat. Anyway, I was playing along with that for like four days and I wrote this song that wasn't very good. And then I had to just kind of scrap it and apply myself again. And I just wrote it and wrote it and wrote it and wrote it. I went in the studio from 10 till five or six for five days and I would sing melody and melody and this, this is too clever, this is too melodic, this is... I just knew what I wanted, but I, I, I knew what it would be when I found it. Hey, I'm, I'm talking a little bit like a, I've written a day in the life. I know it's... But that's what I had it's to a do. Good, and, it's a great song, man. It's a great thank song. Thank you very much. Well, I appreciate that because I worked song. my ass off doing it. I, I just kept writing these vocal melodies that were too melodic. So it became a real craft the interesting thing about that song is that sometimes I have ideas and I've had these ideas from being a kid where I have an idea for what would be a good song away from the guitar and away from the studio and I have it in my mind and then I set about trying to do it and when it works out, it's fantastic. Well, it's a wild way to come, come to a song. Like you're, you're not even in the realm of music, you're away from it. The, yeah. the, you would think that that would be the worst song, potentially, that it's like this thing where you're like conceptualizing it before you even have the chance to, you know. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really glad it works out. But I was determined. Um, and to be fair, I think when you're talking about skill, say, one of the skills that I've learned that I didn't have years ago was I learned this perseverance from Bernard Sumner from New Order, working with Bernard for nine years in electronic if he had an idea for a song and he believed in it, he would not let that thing go away. He would keep coming back to it until it was right. So that was a skill that I've learned along the way from somebody else. It, was, it wasn't It was to do with, you know, diatonic scales or to do with, uh, you know, music theory. It was to do with application process. Yeah. And I've learned on that subject, it's been, I could go through all the people I've worked with and tell you what I've learned from him. Mm. Now I think about it, I, I might be getting a little bit sentimental in my old age, but Isaac Brock, Chrissy Hind, everyone, everyone. Really, I learned something from from all of them, you know. What, what about from Chrissy? Uh, Chrissy, uh, hey, listen, well, I played with her last week at Glastonbury, you know, and, and that was amazing rejoining the to playing those songs after 30 years you know because I, wow. I haven't played them since 1980 whatever so Chrissy well I learned that there's a, a lot when you walk on stage even though I don't want to embarrass her she might not even realise this but when you walk on stage as the front man you give off the vibe to the rest of the band that no matter what happens you've got this mm. and I picked that up because I was very young when I was working with Chris, I was 24 and we were doing these, we were pl playing sometimes, we played to 100,000 people opening for you too. And certainly 70,000 people most nights on the Joshua Tree tour. And I'm telling you, I was terrified. But when I walked behind her on stage, I was like, it's cool, she's got this. <laughs> and I try and be that for my band. Yeah. And also, you know, things like in rehearsal, when you hear that one, two, three, four, when you start singing, you sing like you're on stage. None of this, like, looking at your phone or looking up at the roof and, or, you know, being distracted. When, for those four minutes that you're singing, you really uh, are in it. Yeah, I learned a lot from Chrissy. yeah. She's quite dedicated as, a, in her, as her role as front, front person. In a natural way. In a mm. natural way, because a big part of her as well is that she's a punk rocker and she's not too referential. The business of being in a band, she honours that she thinks being in a band is a special thing and especially her relationship with a guitar player that goes right That's back to beautiful. jimmy scott who i was a big fan of when i was a kid which you can really hear in my playing you know yeah 
Speaking of like, you know, you're sort of thinking of yourself as a pop musician. It, in a weird way, on paper, it could look like a strange pairing. But I think having spoken to you now, it seems to make a ton of sense. You and Hans Zimmer and Pharrell <laughs> getting together yeah. about a decade ago to work on some of that Spider-Man stuff. Like, yeah, well, you know, well I, I've got to say, this is classic Hans because Hans is a real lateral thinker. He, he really thinks outside of the box. And... um he genuinely has told me this so many times now that I really think it's true. So when me and Pharrell first got in a room together and we, we wrote two songs on that, that thing, just me and him, Hans loved telling this story that he was watching the guy who wrote, literally watching the guy who wrote Heaven Knows I'm Miserable Now, writing a song with the guy who wrote Happy. He thought that was <laughs> hilarious. And um, so we got offered that movie, The Amazing Spider-Man 3, and he and I got together and he was like, well, what comes to mind? What are you thinking? I don't really know the franchise very much, but I had this idea. I saw the opening scene, saw a real rough of it, and it was New York and it was like there was a lot of action and everything. And I, I, was, I said, you know what? It should, it should be like The Who. I, I wasn't thinking classic rock, but I was just thinking it should be like Won't Get Fooled Again. It should be like, if you're asking me as a guitar player, power chords, it should, whoa, this big kind of explosive thing. I never think in terms of metal, it's just not my bag. But yeah. if I think explosive, I think of like The Who or whatever. And he really yeah. liked that idea. And then from that, he jumped then to like having a band in a room. So straight away, because Junkie XL was, he, he had a studio in the same building that we were in. And he was brilliant. He's like, well, listen, we'll get Junkie XL on bass. And then um, we had this idea about this explosive pop, but Hans then was like, who's the most melodic singer that you can think of? Who's like, who's amazing at coming up with melodies? And he just said, let's just ask Pharrell. And I was like, huh. <laughs> well, I was like, well, this will be interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the first person to say this at all. But when... Pharrell comes in the room, he's like, where's the tune? Let me write a tune. He's amazing. <laughs> we were putting the song down. I'm, sh I don't, I'm sure he won't mind me telling this story. I'd been for a run in the morning and I had this idea for that we needed a, a romantic song. We needed like the love the love song in this. And I just happened to be out running in the morning and I heard that this, this tune in my head. I was like, oh, that'll be good. So I'll get, I was enthusiastic to get in the studio and put this tune down. So I got in the studio kind of early and we we're in this big room and I started laying this down and there were some of the musicians, a couple of string players, piano, and I think I mean Hans was playing piano. And Pharrell wasn't there. And we started putting these running the chords down and I've got this tune and we're putting it down and we're recording it. And about the second time I get through this tune, Pharrell walks in and uh we're halfway through the tune and he's kind of trying to be quiet and not make a noise. And he's got he picks the microphone up and when we finish doing this quick run through, we go to start a third one for some technical reason. And he, he's asking Steve Lipson the, to stop the track. I want to sing. And Hans goes, can we just put the track down? He goes, I want to. Now, my point in telling this story is that most musicians know that is the opposite of what happens. What usually happens is you have a tune and you put the tune down and you have to wait for days for the singer to sing. Pharrell was like, plug this in, plug this in, let me sing. It was brilliant. And he's um, in the control room, he's tapping on his phone all the time, tapping on his phone, writing lyrics. Wow. So in my experience with, with, with Pharrell for, on, on that movie, was he, he was, he's exactly what I, I thought he was. Just music just oozes out of the guy. I love it. Yeah, so that was this funny thing. But when, I, when I've been asked a couple of times about collaboration, right, I use that, that example of writing with Pharrell as an illustration as to what happens in the collaborative process because on the face of it, what I say is it's like when you've got two musicians working together. On the face of it, look, I'm an indie rock musician from Manchester in the 80s and then Pharrell is a R&B you know, hip hop, pop musician from America. But I would say it's a bit like you get in a rowboat and the two ears are rowing in the same direction and the horizon is the speakers. I think the point is, is that music and collaboration and when you're trying to create something with someone, even if you don't know them very well, it transcends your 
being from you know different backgrounds completely transcends it yeah uh music's amazing for that and collaboration is amazing you're both trying to just come up with a really good middle eight <laughs> and because of that because people on the outside will go oh yeah you have to check your egos at the door or you well i mean that's a given because yeah people who are serious they just want to make something great and it's not even a question of um egos you know i mean the people the people i've worked with the greats you know they yeah, i'm sure they have an ego when they're getting out on stage but when it comes down to work they know yeah. you know you've got to put the hours in billy eilish is like that yeah alicia keys is like that just real hard working rolling the sleeves up and putting the hours in you know all right talking about greats who put in the work what was it like observing or being a part of the the Joshua Tree tour, like seeing you two in that moment, as up close as you were. Well, the amazing thing was, um, I told Edge this actually that so when I joined that tour because the Pretenders have been doing it for a while, and then the guitar player quit, and then I joined on there. At that point, Bono was doing this thing where he's in front of whatever seventy, eighty thousand people. And they've got this material that is just really sounding good in those stadiums. And don't forget, it was new music then, where the streets have no name and uh, still haven't found what I'm looking for. They were new songs that Hard people were just hearing on the radio, <laughs> right? Hard so it was like, whoa, this is a pretty good place to be. I was stood at the side of the stage going, wow, when you hear that, um, when you hear where the streets have no name, which I think they used to start with, you go, what? I think this song's going to stick around for a while. And so there was a vibe and they come on and Bono was doing this thing where midway through the set or whatever, he would climb up onto the PA and then he would climb onto whatever on some lighting truss or whatever. And he was hanging down off doing that thing and he'd be hanging down off it. And, uh, you know, and Chrissy said to me, God, look at that. You know, he's kind of laughing about it. What does he think he's doing? And I said to her, you know, Chrissy, I saw him do that in front of about 40 people in a little room in Manchester when they first came to Manchester in 1980, I want to say. Me and my pals went down. We'd heard about him on the John Peel show. And um, I thought, that's really cool because he was doing it back then. <laughs> and also, I guess the, um, the music, I think I started to see that. Well, first off, you've got to have a real... Um, got to have a lot of energy to be the head of you know that, that kind of organization with like you know 15 trucks and such a big big organization you know that takes a lot out of you during the day forget even the shows just being the center of all of that operation which you know made me realize that I'm kind of okay with being what I am you know but because you know <laughs> I don't like a lot of fuss uh, so I really admired that but how masterful it was that you the tunes have to be really um if you listen to those that kind of music which i guess was part of de what defined now stadium music it's very simple but it's uh in and i remember those those nights as being free there's a lot of motion in that music simple doesn't necessarily mean uh like vacuous yeah that's a good you point you know I still haven't found what i'm looking for is such a do do and and the singing man yeah so yeah that was really uh that was, that was very very cool and again you know the chemistry of a band if ever you know you want to talk about chemistry you know look at those guys yeah. they're kind of really archetypal yeah. you know yeah. the, the edges are really archetypal his role in the band yeah. you know he's kind of arty and he's he's, he's got a, a imagination and he he sort of paints pictures and with his guitar sound and all of that and Adam really holds it down and then Bono's a flamboyant on stage and off kind of concepts guy and then Larry's the guy who kind of really is, he formed the whole thing and he's like the engine in a way yeah so uh, it comes back to that thing of you are what you play yeah when I think about the edge I also start to think about like Johnny Greenwood oh yeah I mean he seems to me like you also where it's like it's sort of just down to like how, like it doesn't matter how complicated it sounds. It's just like what fits this track, you know? And, and is adventurous similar yeah. to you as well? 
Well, the difference between me and Johnny, that, though, is that he's been able to grow with the same musicians over a long period of time. Yeah. You know, I mean, because, again, they're, they're another band, you know, with amazing chemistry. You know, they've all become who they are. I mean, I know now, that, you know, they've got to a place where they're all doing their own projects and everything. But Johnny's been in a place where he's been able to grow with Phil Selway playing behind him and with yeah. Tom next to him. The difference with me is that I've had to, I've done that in different bands. Yeah. I think that's a big difference between me and Johnny. You know, in a way, if you like, Johnny's Johnny's family stayed together a long time. Yeah. Whereas my family was a very, my the family I was known for was very short-lived, you know, yeah. the Smiths, which is fine. No, it happens with a lot. More bands in than the ones that stayed together for 40 years. Think about the Beatles too. The Beatles, the Beatles short-lived, but a lot of, packed a big punch in their time and it's, it's so Absolutely. Similar to I mean you look at the work you guys did in the short amount of time it's like damn it's a lot of it's a lot of work yeah yeah it felt like that and, and yeah I'm very extremely proud of it but I think Johnny's uh, as well as being supremely talented I, I, I think he's been in a place where he can really um, he occupies his his place in that band and has done for a long time now yeah. And it is, you know, that band that they've all, they've all sort of grown around each other. You know what I mean? Yeah. You pick any album like Kid A or that, you know, Amnesiac, that period. I really like in Rainbows as well. And um, they've all kind of evolved together. So, so I think that's really, that's really suited him as a musician. I think it always suited my personality to kind of flit around really. You know, it doesn't come as any surprise to me whatsoever that I've been in loads of different bands. Going back to the beginning of our conversation, I, I love that it's something you've done. I, and I wish you, I, I don't know, it's like, you know, if I had my druthers, I, my personal taste taken into consideration, if I had my druthers, I would have that happen more often. Like I love seeing different, like going back to jazz, like I love, it's like, I love the fact that I can pull up and be like, oh, I wanna hear, oh, I can hear Oscar Peterson play with, with Chet Baker on this one, or I can hear, oh, I wanna hear Wayne Shorter play with, you know, Jimmy Cobb instead of what you know yeah I, I, right i just want to hear what the different f combinations and formations sound like and that's what's cool about and why i got into making those playlists around you is because it's like just cool to hear how someone sounds in different contexts with different people different times it's it's just fun yeah thanks well sometimes i think what i do is is more heard in some situations than others so in, in the there there was co quite a lot of space for me to do my thing in um especially on the dusk album you can hear you can hear me quite a lot, and then in other times, like with ele with electronic, the guitar kind of got squeezed out. But that was my actually down to me, because I was really kind of getting getting so into electronic pop, and I just got really enthusiastic for that. And I guess you know I just sort of fell out of love with being a rock musician during that period. But that's okay because I was only twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven. It's all part of it, and I've done that now. Yeah. And um, if you know, but but where the guitar did featuring on electronics records like feel every beat and get the message uh it was pretty interesting stuff i kind of wish that i'd done more of it uh and bernard was always to be fair bernard was always encouraging me to do more of it but i wanted to learn about other other aspects of record making then so it is all, all, all what it is and you know and on the cribs record that i made th there's plenty of me on the, on that stuff i can hear a lot of that so i mean i really feel like as a and I don't mean to sound glib or, or whatever, but I kind of think of it as a British guitar player, I've kind of had the best job I could think of. Yeah. I mean, genuinely. You know, I, I understand, uh, sure, because the Smiths are so revered and, and so loved over time and almost, you know, time's made the band even, almost even more kind of, you know, uh, valued or whatever. The big narrative is people assume, oh, the band was so short-lived, if only they could stay together for longer and all of that. But it makes total sense to me that, for, just speaking for my own life, that I've I've done all of this different stuff as a guitar player. It, it's entirely the person I was when that when I was 14, 15. And I say that all the time, and it's it was the person that I kind of dreamed of being, really. I mean, obviously, you know, life life throws all kinds of curveballs without getting down, you know, too philosophical. Nothing's, uh, doesn't turn out like a fairy tale, but professionally, man, I can't, sometimes I think, wow, I was in, I was in the, the, they were my favorite band at the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you did maybe, you know? and you were with them on maybe, the, you know, like maybe their best record, you know, like Dusk is like, yeah. you know. Dusk is a real good one. Yeah. 
it's just weird how it all turned out. And then, you know, I was really, you know, when, when I, um, the short thing with Body Smouse was that I went for a period where the late 90s where I, I just wasn't really hearing that much in British guitar music that excited me. But I was hearing it in American guitar music. I Built to Spill I really liked. And there was a band called The, Lil the Lilies I really liked from out of uh, Boston. I thought the Lilies were great. And um, and then and Elliot Smith and what happened was I, I met Elliot. And you met he, Elliot Smith? Oh, yeah, I met Elliot a couple of times. And the first wow. time I met him, I was talking to him about these bands and he hit me up to Modest Mouse. I didn't know who Modest Mouse was. It was Elliot who told me about Modest Mouse. Wow. And he said, well, listen, have you heard of Modest Mouse? He, he said something like, all roads lead to Modest Mouse. I was like, oh, okay. So that's how I got into, um, he turned me on to Moon and Antarctica. And then six, seven years later, I ended up being a full-time member of the band for like longer than people think. I, thought I joined the band 2005 and I left the band 2010, I think. Amazing. Uh, and, and ended up moving to Portland. So that was all down to Without Elliot, I wouldn't have known about that. How did you um, meet Elliot? Uh, I was in LA and a mutual friend said he wanted to meet me and we had a couple of mutual friends and I think XO had just come out and I thought that yeah. was great. I just thought he was really good. Yeah. And and then I, then I knew a couple of his musicians and he always had really nice... The thing about him was the people I knew who worked with him were all really nice people. Yeah. Um, my friend Scott, he was his drummer for a while. So we had kind of... We had a sort of mutual sort of scene really so good yeah but I look back on all this and uh, I think wow I'm kind of glad I'm glad that things worked out it worked out amazingly before we go man do you have I see your guitars back there do you have your nine you have a you have a book coming out called Mars Guitars that I'm excited yeah. to check out do you have your nine pickup <laughs> guitar <laughs> back there no one's ever asked me about that guitar <laughs> uh, they probably won't again just uh, no, it's in my actual studio because this is okay. this is my house now but it's an amazing sound. It's a fucking crazy it's, looking guitar. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't drink anymore. But uh, <laughs> I, I wasn't actually drunk when I bought it, I may add. But it was back in the days when I was like drinking quite a lot. I was, I was either drunk from the night before, but I went into a guitar shop with Noel Gallagher. It was only, I think it was maybe the, might be when the very first day we met. And I saw this thing and I just was like, my logic for buying that guitar was like, okay, if Kraftwerk played guitar, that's what they would play. Noel had only just met me, and I think he thought, this guy is a crazy, crazy <laughs> rock star. <laughs> that's a fair assessment. <laughs> but you know what? Maybe it was about, what, it, probably almost 30 years later, I had to wait to get a song out of it, but it was Spirit, Power, and Soul. Ah, oh, so cool. It came up with the riff, so hey... That's my hey, that's that's my excuse and I'm sticking to it. Man, I got a thousand and one questions for you, man. Thank you so much. It's such a such a pleasure talking to you. All right, man. All the best. Thank you. See ya. Thanks to Johnny Marr for talking about his epic career. You can hear all of our favorite tracks featuring Marr as well as some of his solo work on a playlist at brokenrecordpodcast.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Broken Record. Broken Record is produced with help from Leah Rose, Jason Gambrell, Ben Holiday, and Eric Sam. Our editor is Sophie Crane. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. And if you like the show, please remember to share, rate, and review us on your podcast app. Our theme music's by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richman.